Good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure this morning to introduce our speaker. We started this thing called Community Chapels. Today is the, the last one for February in honor of Black History Month. And the gentleman that we've asked to come, our brother in the Lord, is someone with a national presence in our country. God's given me a tremendous platform to serve. He's the chairman of the Douglas Leadership Institute, the national chairman, the national chairman for the Frederick Douglass Foundation. He was appointed by former Maryland Governor Hogan to be in the Bicentennial Commission to honor Frederick Douglass. He's the executive director for the Human Coalition, a culture of life organization helping women and children and families throughout the country. The list goes on and on and on of his incredible national accomplishments. And what's most impressive to me and should be to all of us, brothers and sisters, is his commitment to Jesus Christ, to the gospel of Jesus Christ. He serves and he loves the Lord and serves the Lord and serves his neighbor well. Would you please join me in giving a great Cornerstone University welcome to our speaker as we close out Black History Month, Bishop Dean Nelson. <laughs> Bishop Nelson, thank you for being here. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. All right. That was, uh, that was good. I almost wanted to figure out who you were talking about. <laughs> It's a pleasure to be with you this morning at Cornerstone. Uh, as stated, I'm Dean Nelson, and I am blessed to serve in a number of capacities, uh, both at the Frederick Douglass Foundation, Douglass Leadership Institute, uh, as well as uh, Human Coalition. Uh, we have a, a kind of an internal uh, mission statement at Human Coalition, um, and that is we want to make abortion unthinkable within our culture. And uh, it's just grateful to be able to serve uh, in that capacity. I want to take a few things uh, this morning to, to say. I uh, want to introduce you to a few people that I brought with me. Uh, these are fantastic leaders that um, have supported me and support our organization. So first, I'd love to uh, ask the uh, Kentwood Commissioner, uh, Jessica Ann Tyson, if she would stand. <laughs> Jessica also serves as the president of the Frederick Douglass Foundation here in the great state of Michigan. Our tagline is righteousness, justice, liberty, and virtue. And probably more importantly, if you've never been to her restaurant, The Candied Yam, you need to go. I'm just telling you, if you want some delicious soul food, uh, that is a place to go. So Jessica, thank you so much for your uh, commitment to serving us at the Frederick Douglass Foundation. Uh, also with me, uh, all the way from Detroit, uh, is my brother from another mother, uh, Pastor Donald Eason. Uh, when I first met him, uh, I was like, man, this dude reminds me so much of my brother. Actually, I have a brother back in D.C., and they, uh, they're very similar. But Pastor Eason, uh, in addition to pastoring uh, in the Detroit area, serves as the Great Lakes Regional Director for the Douglas Leadership Institute. Uh, Pastor Eason, if you would just stand, grateful to have you here with us this morning. So, it is Black History Month, and uh, thank you so much, Dr. Moreno, for allowing me to be here uh, with your fantastic students and faculty. This is actually the second time uh, that I've been on your fantastic campus, and I will say that uh, the hospitality and the warmth is always uh, received well, and uh, we'll say that the, uh, the warmth from the students and the faculty is always better than the warmth, uh, the temperature outside. So uh, I'm grateful that uh, I've been able to, uh, to be here once before and to experience uh, all that you guys have. You guys have a great president. Just give him a round of applause. He is, uh, I, I, we, we've kindred spirits. I can tell he's serious about God. Uh, he loves America and he loves this university. Uh, when we were talking uh, before I came, he kind of wanted to set up a Zoom call, which was cool, um, but I figured that he was kind of checking me out a little bit. I think he wanted to find out if my, uh, my theology and my worldview was, uh, was okay. Uh, he asked me some questions about, uh, you know, did I, uh, you know, uh, have you know love and commitment to America? I said yes, you know yes, sir. He says, um, well, what about the uh, Constitution? You committed to the Constitution? I said, well, yeah, sure. I says, what about the other founding principles? I said, yeah, I'm committed to the founding principles. 
He says, well, what about free speech? I said, yeah, I believe in free speech. He said, well, come to Cornerstone and give one. And so, uh, <laughs> so, uh, so, no, it was just a joke. It's just, it's just a joke. Um, but we did have a very good connection, and uh, I was really grateful, uh, grateful to God to get to know him a little bit better. Um, I do believe that we have uh, a kindred spirit and a great desire to see God do something great in this generation. Uh, I have some notes here, and maybe I'll get to them. Um, I don't know. But um, I want to at least draw your attention to a, a website uh, that we created a few years ago. It's called Who is Frederick Douglass? And the reason that we created this website in part is because uh, several years ago, there was an academic who wrote an article about Frederick Douglass. And it was five myths about Frederick Douglass. And when I read through these myths about Frederick Douglass, one of the myths was that Frederick Douglass was a dedicated Christian. They were saying that that was a myth. And when I really went and explored, what I realized that in our generation, we have a lot of people that want to recreate our heroes in their image and in their likeness. They want to retell stories. Today, if you were to visit Washington, D.C. and look at the monument that is dedicated to Martin Luther King Jr., you will see that there's nothing that references him as a preacher of the gospel. We live in a culture where it is increasingly hostile to the faith that you and I have, and I believe that God desires to use you as an emerging generation to reclaim Jesus and to reclaim what he has called us to do in a nation that is becoming hostile towards the gospel that you and I believe in. I want to encourage you, just as someone encouraged me years ago when I was a student at the University of Virginia, to pursue God to seek the Lord, and ultimately when you find him, then to take what God has given you and to impact your generation for his glory. I want to say that uh, as I was preparing to come uh, to Cornerstone and thinking about what it was that the Lord would have me to share with you, uh, I was reminded of the time that I was a, a student on college campus. And I had grown up uh, in the church um, and certainly had a relationship with God. But when I was challenged by professors and others about what it is that I really believed, uh, it required me to dig a little bit deeper. It required me to search a little harder. And how many of you know that the Lord promises that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him? And I promise you that as I was in that small chapel on the college of the University of Virginia with a handful of students, as we pursued God and sought after God with some of the challenges that we were dealing with on our campus, and some of those are the same kind of challenges that we deal with today, God met us in a real way. And so even though I don't get the opportunity to speak on college campuses that much anymore, it is a great privilege and honor and a treat for me to be able to be with all of you today. Just last week, I was also blessed to be at Princeton uh, University, speaking to a number of students that have a commitment to God and are believing God to see revival come to their campus. Some of you have probably heard about some of the you know, experiences of God and revival that's been taking place at Asbury College, at Lee University, at Campbell, and at Cedarville. And I'm excited to, believe, to, to hear more testimonies of what God is doing because I do believe that every generation should have the opportunity to experience God in a significant way. How many of you believe that? And I can tell from the worship here, I can tell that there's, there's something that God is doing on your campus. And I just want to encourage you in that way. And I will talk to you a little bit today about my experience, but also I'd like to kind of put it in the context of the person that I have come to know and love to celebrate is Frederick Douglass. And we'll talk a little bit about Mr. Douglass's experience and encounter with God as well.
It was in uh, 1987, so that dates me. So, you know, just to let you know, I have three kids that are all of college age, so um, uh, I, uh, I do get the opportunity to co- talk to college students all the time, I guess, actually, in that way. <laughs> but on our campus, I remember we had set out to try to impact our, our college campus for, for God. And I remember as we gathered a group of students praying uh, in the chapel, we felt that the Lord wanted us to host an event on campus, and it was an outreach event. And for the first time in my life, uh, I, uh, I heard about fasting. And we as a group began to pray and fast. Now, I promise you, it was probably just two days, but it felt like two weeks. <laughs> I mean, the first time if you participated in fasting, it was, it, it was a struggle. But I remember as we began to seek God and we began to pray and we gathered together and prayed, uh, we had this event. And there were about 100 people that showed up at the event. And I don't know if you've ever been in these situations where you're really trusting and you're really hoping that God is going to at least do something. And I remember praying to the Lord as I sat on that front row. I was like, Lord, if you would just have one that would come to you. And I was so afraid to open my eyes because I was like, well, Lord, what if nobody comes? Even though we had prayed, even though we had fasted, there's this sense about like, Lord, will you really do what we've asked you to do? And as I mustered up enough strength and opened up one eye on the front row, to my surprise, everyone who was in that auditorium was now on the front row. There were about 85 students that had come and given their lives to Christ. Some rededicated their lives to the Lord, and some for the very first time. And there was such uh, an awesome experience of God that we had on our college campus during that time period. I didn't really know what to do, but um, the, uh, the guy who came and, and, and preached for us that day, and it was mostly, you know, I'll just say this, it was mostly an African-American student group. And uh, I, I, when I see God moving significantly at, at Asbury and at other places, sometimes I personally am wondering, I was like, Lord, you know, um, why aren't you, like, doing something more at some of these other historically black colleges and universities? But you know what I believe? I believe that God is doing something. Just because the media doesn't necessarily cover it doesn't mean that God's not working. How many of you know that God is working? (laughs) Out of that experience, I knew that my call to God was to be able to engage with the culture. I knew that I had a call from God to be able to uh, go into full-time vocational ministry, and I did. And in that time... I began to see God do some fantastic things over the years, but I believe honestly that it is his desire for every generation to be able to experience a significant move for him. How many of you are desirous to see that in your generation? Additionally, I feel like that another thing that has to happen in every generation is also that God has to reaffirm through his people a commitment to biblical orthodoxy. What do I mean by that? I mean that every, and a, my, my father, grandfather in the Lord, a guy, a Presbyterian a theologian by the name of Jay Grimstead, who is a fantastic uh, uh, trumpet player, uh, but is also a theologian who kind of mentored me and some other guys. He studied under Francis Schaeffer at Labrie, but Jay would always encourage us that in every generation, there needs to be a reaffirmation of God's word, his inerrant word, and a biblical understanding. Because what happens is sometimes if you have genuine encounters with God, but you don't have uh, spiritual or biblical guidelines, you can be led off into uh, uh, other, other areas. I've seen this in my own life, guys that maybe had an encounter with God but didn't have an abiding commitment to God's word ended up going off into a heresy. Some guys that began to elevate Um, uh, uh, liberation theology above sound doctrine, they began to think that the cause was more important than the creator. God is the one who is initiating something in us, and all of us should be encouraged and desires to make an impact within our culture, but we have to do it God's way. Can somebody say amen? Amen. So 
So through this experience and this encounter that I had, I began to go, I went into full-time vocational ministry. And uh, as I began to pursue the Lord, I was asking God, you know, uh, how, how should we continue to um, represent you in, in areas? And ultimately, God called me into what I would call the cultural political arena. And um, I will just say it is a calling. <laughs> I would much rather be here talking to college students than in Washington, D.C., fighting with politicians. But that is part of what God has called me to do. And uh, I, 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 I received that, uh, that calling and am inspired to do it every day. But uh, I want to encourage you to begin to take seriously your role today. I was a rhetoric major. We studied Aristotle, and I believe it was Aristotle who once said that all who have meditated on the art of governing mankind are convinced that the fate of empires rests on the education of our youth. In a similar way, Abraham Lincoln, I think it is credited to him, is by saying that the philosophy in the classroom in one generation is the philosophy in government in the next. I want to encourage you in your passion and your pursuit for the Lord. Also commit yourself to dig a little bit deeper for first and second level research so that you actually kind of are like how the book of Daniel talks about that you have an excellent spirit, that there's no person that is outside of the kingdom of God that could challenge you because you've studied, you've prayed, but you also have a clear understanding and a biblical worldview of how to answer the objections that those have without. You see, I believe that those that Daniel was talking about, about having an excellent spirit, they weren't just those who uh, they, could, they could pray all night or they could have vision for the future, but they also understood languages. They understood arts. They understood entertainment, but they also understood science and they understood uh, mathematics. I believe that we have a call to have a higher standard. Can somebody say amen? So I want to encourage you while you're here, have fun, pursue God but also get all of the learning that you can get as long as you understand that Christ is the foundation. I had the opportunity last year to speak to a woman who is a spirit-filled, dedicated believer, but she also graduated from Yale University. She's a doctor. She now teaches at Notre Dame Academy, and she was so powerful in her testimony as she talked uh, to Congress about the sanctity of human life. It was like the last thing that they expected to hear. It was like an African-American woman who was a doctor. They, they expected her to have a, uh, a typical kind of a, quote unquote, uh, uh, pro-abortion kind of position because they are asking the question about disparities in the African-American community. They were asking about the challenges that black women would experience. And she says, listen, abortion is not health care. She says there are ways that we can encourage and, and serve women who find themselves in these difficult situations. The organization that I serve with, Human Coalition, we have, we've engaged with hundreds of thousands of women around the country who are seeking abortions. And 76% of those women say that they would choose to parent if their circumstances were different. One of the things that I love about this emerging generation is you guys are concerned about justice. You're concerned about those who are down and out. And if that stat is true, which I know that it is, 76%, that's the vast majority of the million, roughly million abortions that are occur every year. But 76% uh, of those women say, listen, if I had somebody to hold my hand, if I had somebody to walk with me, if I had someone to help me to bridge the gap, I would be able to care for my preborn child. How many believe that the church is called to make a difference in that area? Amen. There's probably no greater American in my mind who has done a better job of embracing the ministry or the work of righteousness and justice than the great abolitionist Frederick Douglass. As a young boy, my mother brought me a, uh, a stack of black history comic books. 
And in that stack of black history comic books, there was one figure who had two comic books. It was Frederick Douglass because he lived such a long life. And so at a very early age, that was my introductory to Mr. Douglass. As I began to learn more about Frederick Douglass, I was fascinated by this person who uh, would escape from slavery in 1838 while he was still a teenager on his third attempt. As I leaned into Frederick Douglass a little bit more, I learned that he actually, at the age of roughly 12 or 13, had, you guessed it, a divine encounter with God. In fact, I'm gonna read for you specifically a little bit about that encounter that he had with God. How many of you are familiar a little bit with um, the second great awakening that took place uh, in America? So this was like a revival time that, that began to sweep you know, throughout America in the 1800s with notable uh, abolitionists and revivalists like Charles Finney. Frederick Douglass, as a young boy, was at a revival type of meeting and encountered the words from a man uh, who was a minister by whose last name or whose name was Hanson. But I wanna read to you a little bit about this encounter because it's similar to what I experienced and I believe it's similar to what many people are experiencing. But out of this encounter that he had with God, that launched him into the worldwide ministry and statesman and abolitionist movement that Frederick Douglass was a part of that we all know about today. I'll just begin reading here, and it says, as a young man, Frederick Douglass had an encounter with God through a Methodist preacher named Hanson. This had a profound impact on Douglass that would lay a foundation of faith that would guide him for the rest of his life. He said this, I knew very well that I was wretched and had no means of making myself otherwise. I was for weeks a poor, broken-hearted mourner traveling through the darkest misery of doubts and fears. I finally found that change of heart which comes by casting all of one's cares upon God and by having faith in Jesus Christ, the Redeemer, friend, and Savior for those who diligently seek him. He said, it seemed, I, to, it seemed that I live now in a new world, surrounded by new objects and animated by new hopes and desires. I loved all mankind, slaveholders not accepted. Though I abhorred slavery, slavery more now than ever, my great concern now was how to have the world converted. You see, many people today don't know that Frederick Douglass had an encounter with God as a young man. Most people who know him as an abolitionist don't know that he was a licensed minister of the gospel. Many people today don't realize or know that Frederick Douglass, once he began to preach on the stump, his favorite text was the Bible. And there's a fantastic book that I would refer you to called Prophet of Freedom that is written a few years ago by a guy by the name of David Blythe, which is probably one of the best uh, biographies that you could read about Frederick Douglass. But Blythe, who I don't believe is a Christian, but as a scholar, basically reaffirms throughout this biography about Douglass's commitment to Christ and his dedication to what he calls in this book a biblical worldview. Frederick Douglass was once quoted as saying, I have one great political idea. He says, the best expression of it I have found in the Bible. It is in substance, righteousness exalts a nation. Sin is a reproach to any people. He says, that's the whole of my politics, the positive and the negative of my politics. Frederick Douglass would go on after escaping from slavery with the woman who would ultimately become his wife, Anna Marie Douglass. They would raise their children in the fear of God. Frederick Douglass' daughter would write frequently about how they were required to memorize scripture at the table and that they were um, understood that they had to uh, a strict uh, moral upbringing that was to be uh, exhibited and to be uh, 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 kind of a, a representation. Why? One of the reasons that when you, when you look at Frederick Douglass, any portrait of Frederick Douglass, matter of fact, he was the most photographed man in the 19th century. And you can't find a portrait of Douglas without him wearing a nice suit and a bow tie almost always. Why? Anybody think about that? 
part of the reason was he was using the technology, photography of the day to portray a different image of a black man because of the caricatures that were around in the culture thinking that black men were not intelligent, that black men could not uh, hold themselves up, that they were not people of dignity. And that's why Douglas wore always when he was in setting, again, the most photographed man of the 19th century, more than Abraham Lincoln, more than anyone else during his day. Douglas was on a mission to eradicate slavery, and to challenge what he called the hypocritical Christianity of his day. How many of you don't like hypocritical Christianity? We want the authentic. Can somebody say amen? Amen. It's a desire. We want the authentic. But just imagine for a moment, Frederick Douglass embracing the gospel, saying that he loved all mankind, even slaveholders. But this was the same man who was owned by a church-going master. This was the same man as stories recount. As they were whipping him and beating him, they were quoting scriptures, slave, obey your master in the Lord. As blood would stream down his back and he's crying out earlier testimonies of, is there a God? But that is the same person who ultimately would have a divine encounter with God that would not only empower him to do great work in ministry, to preach the gospel and to preach the message of deliverance to an entire group of people, but ultimately and supremely, it would cause him to have a heart where in 1883, he would venture back to Easton, Maryland. And while It was about a year before his master would die. He wanted to make sure that he had the opportunity to kneel with him and to pray with him and to say, I forgive you for what you did to me. I don't know about you, but that is, to me, authentic Christianity that can change a nation. You see, it wasn't more about him being right. It was more about him being right with God himself. Douglas took the opportunity to engage with somebody who said that he once owned him, humbled himself, engaged with him, and believed that he could have the power to release that man from anything that he had ever done in his life. To me, I believe that that probably is the greatest form of Christian virtue, is to be able to forgive someone that did the unthinkable to you. I want to encourage you that as you are pursuing God, as you are thinking about your ministry or your mission, as you graduate from this fine institution, what is it that God is requiring of you? And what is it that God is asking you to do inside to fully surrender to him so that he can have the ultimate victory out of your life and ultimately out of your ministry. A last thing that I want to highlight about the work of Frederick Douglass, and this was fascinating that I learned a little bit later on in my life. He had a company of people that he worked with in the abolitionist movement that wasn't, that they were not dedicated to Christians. In fact, they were German atheists and agnostics. And History records that they often were trying to uh, persuade him away from the foundations that he had received in Christianity. Unsuccessful, Douglas continued to work with them in a common cause, but yet tried to influence them towards godly standards and towards Jesus Christ. One of the reasons I believe is that Douglas 
as a young man when he had that encounter with God. He mentions a man by the name of Lawson. Lawson was a slave and he was a mentor towards Frederick Douglass. Douglass would say of Lawson, even though Frederick Douglass could read and write, Douglass would say, I had the letter, but Lawson had the spirit. Even though he was an uneducated slave, Frederick Douglass found encouragement and wisdom from this old man who he said understood the ways of the spirit. Lawson would even prophesy to Frederick Douglass and tell him that even though he was currently a slave, that one day God would use him in a great way. Boy, was Lawson ever right. So I want to encourage you as I get ready to close and begin to pray. If we think about who Jesus is and what he has done for us, and as we think about the examples that he has given us, I think about Hebrews. The author of Hebrews talks about Christ and his supremacy, who Christ is and all that Jesus has done. But then he gives us an example, a long list of, uh, like I call it the hall of faith, leaders that have gone before. And the Bible says some of them never even got the promise. For me, in a very similar way, Jesus is everything to me, but he's given us examples and may want to use you as examples to others to show people that Christ can have an impact in your life, but also he can use you to make a difference in the culture to the glory of God. I want to encourage you as you stand to your feet that today what God is doing at other schools, what God has already done here, what can he do inside of us to propel us to have a movement of righteousness and justice within our culture? You see, in the scriptures, they're always together, but it seems like in our American culture, particularly culturally and politically, it's either you gotta be over here with the justice people or you gotta be over here with the righteous and moral people. I believe God is saying no, that the two of those are intertwined and that you can't have true justice without righteousness. And if you have real authentic righteousness, it then has an impact to do justice within our culture. I would ask if you just raise your hands with me as we pray, Father, in the name that is above every name. Lord, we thank you that you are doing something in us that we are unable to do on our own. And Father, I thank you for the students that have gathered here, Lord, at Cornerstone University, that you have initiated something in their hearts, Lord, to be a better representation, perhaps, of the former generation. Father, I pray that you would do something in their hearts to spark desire and passion for you, but also, Lord, that they would be examples, Lord, of what a real Christian who is committed to righteousness and justice should look like. Lord, we are grateful for what we have heard, the testimonies of what you have done in the past, Lord, in one generation. And Lord, apparently what you're doing today, Lord, at Lee University or at Cedarville, Lord, or at Campbell, Lord, or at Asbury, Lord, what you're doing here at Cornerstone, God, we're asking, do not pass us by. Father, we thank you and we are grateful for what you have done. But Lord, we know desperately that our nation needs you. But Lord, before we say the nation needs you, Lord, we say we need you. Lord, help me, Lord, in my endeavors, not simply to live off of past experience, but Lord, have the vital union of knowing that Jesus Christ is the same today, yesterday, and forever, and that what he desires to do, that he's already willing to do it for those who are willing to say yes to him. Father, we love you, we thank you, and we honor you. Lord, as we conclude, Lord, even, uh, Lord, this month that we refer to as Black History Month, Father, make us reacquainted with, Lord, the Frederick Douglasses and the Harriet Tubmans. Lord, as I remember some of the prayers of the slaves 
as I read them, Lord, how powerful they were. Lord, not seeking, Lord, only freedom in the natural, but wanting to be able to see freedom, Lord, to see Jesus, Lord, in the next life. Father, don't let, Lord, the testimony of their generation, Lord, condemn us because we're not living up to the standard and what they fought for. Lord, we love you and we thank you and we bless you for all that you are doing and all that you will do in the name of Jesus the Christ. Let the people of God say together with a shout, amen, amen. God bless you. Thank you so very much.